Dr. Rohan Deshong, who will speak to us this afternoon on this evening on prostate cancer, the Caribbean experience, and some of our lessons learned throughout these many years of practice. Dr. Deshawn. Owen, thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. Tellisford, thanks for having me and for hosting this program. Uh, it's nice having everyone listening in. Uh, my experience with prostate cancer. Let me start by giving a quick uh, overview of what happened to me this week. So I'm in my office and I'm seeing a patient actually last week. He comes into the office with his daughter. He's 74 years old. His daughter's complaint is that he's losing weight, doc. He doesn't say very much, but I confirm the fact that he's losing weight and he's lost his appetite. How much weight you've lost, I ask him. Doc, about 40 pounds in the last six months. He has loss of appetite. He has back pain. And that's about it. So after confirming that he had very few other things going on, I then examined him. And what I found, it's not atypical, neither is it typical, but it's what the British would call uncommon. It's not common to see it, but it still, in my opinion, happens too often. I felt a hard prostate gland. And I then sent him for his blood test for the prostate, but before which, I just informed his daughter, I think your father has prostate cancer and it has spread. And it con that was confirmed by the PSA. His PSA came back at 6,000, actually more than 6,000. Just remember, for this age group, in a black man, 74, a normal PSA would be, say, four and a half and less, or less. And he was looking at more than 6,000 actually call the lab and ask, can you do me something more specific? And the lab was like, ah, we've already wasted enough money getting up to 6,000. I said, the, dip, the problem is if you just give me 6,000, when I start treating him, if it gives me more than 6,000, again, I wouldn't know whether I'm going up or down. And finding a patient with a PSF over 6,000 is not uncommon. That's fairly common in our Caribbean islands still. It is not the most common presentation, but it's fairly common. Now, how do you know that you have prostate cancer? Everyone asks. I mean, almost everywhere I go, I give, I give talks like every week on prostate cancer, prostate issues, men's health. And the question they tend to ask a lot is, Doc, how do I know that I have prostate cancer? And uh, in many cases, I tell them, you don't know that you have prostate cancer. But how do I know? So if you don't know, how do you know? I said, well, just do the blood test because it's the most accurate and sensitive way of telling that you have prostate cancer that we can cure. Let me repeat myself. The blood test called the PSA for us in the Caribbean is the most accurate and sensitive way of letting you know and us know that you have prostate cancer. Or there are things that you can do along with the blood test that we do as doctors. But for you as a man, we actually encourage you, go and get tested. Go and get your blood tests done because there are no specific symptoms of prostate cancer. And I used that first example because too many men are waiting until they have symptoms. This gentleman, he has what we call symptoms of advanced stage four metastatic or late prostate cancer. They are all the same because we know of stage four, but it speaks of stage four cancer. Uh, we also call it in medicine, advanced cancer, late stage cancer, or metastatic cancer. That is cancer that has spread. You really don't want to wait until your cancer has spread to detect it. You want to detect it before you have symptoms. Any kind of symptoms, we call it 
pre-symptomatic or preclinical or asymptomatic prostate cancer. And the only way you can do it is by doing the blood test. When you do the blood test, the doctor will also combine that blood test with an examination of the prostate. Unfortunately, the prostate isn't easy to feed. It's not like a hand on the belly, a hand on your body, hand on your head. It's deep in your body and you can only access it easily by putting a gloved, lubricated finger in the rectum where you can feel the prostate gland. And that, my friend, is the sticking point for most black men in the Caribbean. We unfortunately, and still today, are a very homophobic society. Men still meet me in the, in the street and say, doc, 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 I come in, you know, I come in, but I don't want that test. And what they're alluding to is the rectal examination. That helps to fine tune the blood test because most of the men who come to us will not be like this gentleman I just described with advanced or late stage prostate cancer. Most will not have prostate cancer. Some would just have a slightly swollen prostate. Others would have a small prostate if they're young or younger in their 40s. And still a few out of 100, maybe 20 or 30 will have a prostate that's swollen and might have a lump on the prostate. Not a normally smooth swollen prostate, but they might have a pea-sized lump, a lump of physical green pea, like one of the pea that we have, or garden pea. The lump might be that size and it might be not the normal um, consistency, rubbery, but it might be hardish. And those are the things that we tend to look for when we examine the prostate gland. We look for the size of the prostate. We look for the consistency of the prostate. We try to find out if it's painful or not, what we call tender, because that might actually suggest an infection, which can sometimes be the reason why your blood test might be on the border or slightly raised. And we also look for lumps, bumps, irregularities, anything that doesn't feel nice and smooth, that feels rough, irregular, or hard. It might be a P-shaped lump. It might be a P-sized lump. It might be the whole half of one prostate that feels abnormal. It might be like in this gentleman, the whole prostate feels abnormal, hard craggy, like a stone. So there are many variations of what we feel from nothing, something small, larger, benign, soft, to painful, a little tender, soft still, or to rubbery with no lumps, or rubbery with lumps. Lumps might be small, one side, both sides of the prostate, or lumps that feel very suspicious, like if this is cancer that has spread. If you're not in that suspicious group, we tend to just do what we know we should do, which is basically we tend to reassure you and tell you, look, you're not in the suspicious group. We're not worried about you. We are going to see you in a year if you are low risk. Low risk meaning you have no family history. You have a low PSA, usually less than one or between one and two and a half for men under 50, uh, you have low risk lifestyle, we will tell you, look, let's come see us in a year. If, however, you are one of these men that we're suspicious of, for example, you're 55 years old and your PSA lies somewhere between two and a half and four, we might, and we've done the physical examination and we, we're suspicious of something, or let's use what we, generally tend to um, see in our Caribbean society, a PSA between four and 10. Remember four is what we consider the upper limit of normal, but most men who have prostate issues will come somewhere between four and 10. Some will have infections, as I said, prostate issues, not cancer, and others will have cancerous growths. So let's say you're between four and 10, We've ruled out infection because we've done a urinalysis and it says there's no infection. And uh, we will tell you right away, you should undergo a biopsy because we can feel a lump. Your PSA is in that suspicious area and we would advise you to go ahead and have a biopsy. 
There are other things that's coming in the last year or two where some men would prefer to go and get an MRI done. And in the last 20 years, you do other differentiating tests like we can do, we can break up the blood test to PSA in two, we can do a free to total PSA and things like that. We can divide the PSA by the size of the gland. So we do what's called a PSA density. But all those, most of the times, I have, in my experience of over 20 years, just kicks the ball down the road. In the vast majority of patients who have a PSA between four and 10 black men, there's a lump on the prostate. We can do these differentiating tests, but we're just kicking the ball down the road. Even if you did an MRI and it says, look, your prostate looks perfectly benign, but your PSA did not go down in six months of a repeat, we would still advise you to have a prostate biopsy, which it's not a painful procedure. It's an office procedure. You will come into the office, pre-dosed with antibiotics usually, meaning we give you antibiotics to take from before the procedure. It's an ultrasound in the um, rectum where we image the prostate. Through that same ultrasound, we can inject the nerves on both sides of the, of the prostate so it's numb. So you won't really have much discomfort or pain from the actual biopsy. What most men would complain of, like most black men, is that most of the discomfort is just having that probe in the rectum. It's not the actual biopsy itself, it's just the discomfort of having a small probe the size of uh, one of your fingers, usually the thumb in the rectum, and it takes about 10 minutes. We take samples from the prostate gland, both left and right. It's not painful generally. Most of the men, when we're doing this test, would have would tolerate it, meaning that doc, it's uncomfortable having the probe in the rectum. I've had a few men who fell asleep during the process, uh, meaning after 10, 15 minutes, they say, doc, you finished? And yeah, finished. They, because we don't just do the biopsy, we actually take pictures and we scan to see what looks suspicious and things like that. After which you hop from the bed, Empty your blood if you need to. Be in yourself. Sit down, discuss the procedure, what you'd expect after. We do it before, but we reiterate or reinforce it after. And you leave the office waiting usually for a week to 10 days to get the results back. That is most, for most men, the most uncomfortable part of most of this prostate treatment, or diagnosis, I should say. After which, we then decide based on what your initial PSA was, how the prostate felt on the examination and the results from this biopsy test. We then basically put you in a group because we have five groups. We have a lowest group, someone whose blood test was less than 10, whose uh, prostate felt either benign, but we did the biopsy because your blood test was higher and uh, it didn't go down with treatment. And uh, this person also had a pathology result that said, you have the slow growing type of prostate cancer. So it came back saying your prostate a biopsy specimen was cancerous. So we just remember, so we have a gentleman who comes in the office, his PSA is like say seven. He didn't want to have a biopsy at the same time. So we did a couple of tests that still suggested it was cancerous. He went on an MRI because he's, Let's say he's 62 and he still doesn't want to have this biopsy test done. So we sent him for MRI. The MRI said, you know, yeah, you do have a risk of having cancer in your prostate. You have what we call a PRAD score, which is a prostate imaging score on the MRI of say four or five. These are highly suspicious of prostate cancer. So he submits to go and undergo a biopsy. It takes 10 minutes. He brings his wife. She holds his hand through the process. It's not painful. He tolerates it. Uh, he comes off bed and says, Doc, that's it. I say, yeah, it's finished. Oh, he breathes hard. I said, oh, I thought it was going to be worse. No, it's not going to be any worse. He goes away. 10 days later, we call him back to the office. Remember, he has a PSA of seven. He has a small lump on his prostate gland. He... Um, has a biopsy specimen reading saying that he has the lowest grade. In other words, it's the least aggressive type. He'd be put in what we call group one. 
Lewis type. And then the other group, group two, group three, four, and five, where group one being the least aggressive type to group five being the most aggressive type. These are men whose PSAs are over 20. Their prostate feels hard or irregular as though there is a cancer that might have spread, you know? Or when the results comes back, he's in the highest group of aggressiveness from the pathology specimen. These are the grade fives. So the grade ones, this gentleman is a grade one. He's mid, uh, he's 62 years old. And we sit and discuss the options for treatment. He is in the best category. He has time on his hands. He came early. He was prompted by his wife, just go get yourself checked out. He has options. He has so many options that he can sit and wait. And there is a school of treatment in our profession that says, if you're slightly older, let's say you're hitting 70 or early 70s and you're in group one, we can actually do nothing. We can sit and watch and wait. We see you once every six months. We do your blood test. Once a year, we do your rectal examination and we monitor. And many of these men go on 10 years later to be still alive without much symptoms. Cancers progress very slowly. They are now 80 years old because we started at 70 and at 85 he dies of diabetes, hypertension, something related to uh, other systems. Absolutely nothing to do with his cancer. He has lived with his cancer. He's died with his cancer from something else. Let's say the 62 year old, he opts to say, Doc, let's wait for a couple of years. Let's see what's going on. Or a couple of months. I have to discuss with my family. I have to discuss with my wife because we're going to have to discuss the effects of treatment from no treatment, which is actually a treatment, to more interventional treatment. Like he might decide, I don't want to have an anesthetic. I want to uh, not go to sleep. So you might offer him. You can go in St. Vincent, we do not have it, but I send my patients to Trinidad, go and get some external beam radiation. He might opt for surgery. You can do open surgery in Trinidad. I mean, in St. Vincent, I just sent one of my patients off to the US to get robotic Da Vinci surgery. And a month ago, I did an open surgery on the patient. They both returned to me and they both are fine. One has a four inch, well, a three and a half inch cut on the bottom of his belly, and the other has half a dozen incisions that adds up to the same uh, three-inch cut on his abdomen. One had a robot, and the other had a human being doing the surgery for him. Both outcomes so far have been great. Now, you can go the other extreme, like the gentleman I saw. So we've looked at a good case scenario. The gentleman I saw Last week, he is the other extreme, the group five, the stage four cancer, the aggressive metastatic spread late stage cancer. His only hope is medical treatment. As Dr. Um, Gabriel will tell you, we use hormones to put the cancer to sleep. And once it goes to sleep, we discuss, we, we monitor and based on how deep at sleeping, quote unquote, and how long it stays, stays sleeping, we can then make decisions about his future. These are men that would have a life expectancy around five years in good hands, especially if the cancer is not aggressive. If the cancer is aggressive, we're looking at two, three years. The first patient who came early, 63 year old, PSF seven, he has an almost normal life expectancy. I can bet you in 10 years, he has a 90, 8% survival rate. That is cancer-free survival rate. In 20 years, his cancer might have recurred, but he's not going to have a lot of symptoms. He's going to live until 85, 88, with minimal prostate issues, should we get all the cancer out. The only things you now have to discuss with him, if he says, yes, doc, I prefer to have an operation or even radiation, whether it be the brachytherapy seed implant or they put in the radiation from outside in, I always explain to the men, you have two options. 
in terms of radiation from outside in or from inside out. Whichever you take, the side effects are almost the same. We worry about the side effect of rectal dysfunction with time for radiation. We worry about it affecting the bladder and the bowel with radiation. For surgery, we worry about urinary continence initially and rectal dysfunction. Both tends to resolve with time. Most men will have some residual amount of uh, urinary incontinence if their bladders are full and they exert themselves. They have to, they have to actually consciously try to prevent themselves from leaking. Uh, but for normal situations, they drive with no problems. Most of them will re, uh, retain their erections. Uh, if they leave for three to six months, we can revive it. It's not impossible. So the vast majority of men who are in the young age group, less than 70, after going through a radical prostate surgery, will have good urinary continence and good erection function. Sometimes it would help, but it's still functioning. Prostate cancer doesn't have to be a death sentence. We have come a long way in the Caribbean from when men used to die of prostate cancer. Even if you were diagnosed with prostate cancer, you can live to a ripe old age of 85. Last anecdote. Today, I saw a gentleman whom I diagnosed in 2004, early. He's now 20 years and five months. It was January 2004. 20 years and five months. And he had fairly, um, what we call, advanced prostate cancer. He would be what we call a locally advanced prostate cancer. He had a PSA of 300, and most people think that was metastatic. Actually, we tested for him, and there was no evidence of metastases. It had not spread. He had a moderately aggressive cancer. It was a 7 out of 10. The lowest one is 6 out of 10. He had a 7 out of 10. His, 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 his um, parameters when you examine his prostate didn't actually feel cancerous. It felt as though he had an abscess in his prostate. I aspirated the fluid from the prostate. It still came back, and then I biopsied him. And it came back as the moderately aggressive type. We went ahead, did hormone treatment, and 21 years almost, he's still alive, and his prostate is now becoming, the cancer is now becoming hormone resistance. In other words, it's no longer sensitive to the treatment that used to keep it under control. He is now considering one of our novel new, uh, what we would say, chemotherapeutic agents, which is actually hormone treatment. Dr. Gabriel will tell you about it. It's called Zytiga or Abiaterone. He's now considering using that. He says, Doc, it's the cash. I don't have the cash. But it's not that expensive. Zytiga used to be $3,000 a month supply when it came to the Caribbean five, six years ago. We've now gotten the price down to very close to $7,800. $7, the pharmacy next door to me sells it for $1,200. The government brings it in for certain patients for $800. So... And we've gotten it down to below that in some instances. And this would prolong your life for another two to three years, you know, making you fairly comfortable without much symptoms. For someone who's been 20 years taking medication for his prostate cancer, which has now become non-responsive to that medication, we have medication to push you beyond that. He is 77 years old, so he was diagnosed as 57, well, 56, and uh, he most likely would have another two to three years, maybe up to 80, 85 if possible, still being alive 25 years after being diagnosed with prostate cancer. So it doesn't have to be a death sentence. Dr. Gabriel? Thank you so much, Dr. Deshaun. That was such a, a, a nourishing um, presentation. I, I would, I'm sure you all agree that we could find no better person to speak on the topic of prostate cancer. 
as Dr. Deshaun has said in his presentation, we've, we've covered so many aspects of the is this disorder. We know that, I mean, I heard words like um, PSA, digital rectal examination, ultrasound, um, trans rectal ultrasounds, biopsies. Um, we've heard about uh, surgical intervention, the Da Vinci um, robotic surgery, which which you know is nerve sparing, so that I'm sure we'll come to that about men remaining have keeping the ability to to have an erection. Let's let's keep the words as they are, <laughs> and so on. I'm sure men, some men here will have that question to ask about, and we've heard about you know. Um, Doctor Deshawn, could you unmute yourself? I'm saying, saying I was just agreeing with you. Sorry that men value their erections a lot. That's one That's of the right. big dis the, um, deciders for men in terms of treatment. They want to know, doctor, will I lose my erection? And if so, how long? Will I ever be able to have it, get it back? They put that at the top. It's what we call a QOL issue. And you would know the QOL, why? The quality of life years issue, where instead of me living, just existing, knowing that I've survived prostate cancer, I want to have some quality to my life, you know? So yes. they value that. Yes, Dr. Sean, I mean, in, in, in the realm of things that we're speaking about now, about, you know, maintaining the erection, I, I don't know whether you, you agree and you, you this is part of your experience. Years ago, the majority of men who presented with prostate cancer were elderly, you know, 70s, later on, do you find that recently or in the last few years that the age of presentation appears to be getting lower and younger and therefore the question of an er erection and er erectile dysfunction becomes even more prominent and relevant to the men with prostate cancer? Yes, because, because of that blood test called the PSA or prostate specific antigen, Okay, we are, and men are intrigued with the option of having a blood test to pick them up. They don't like the finger test, so they prefer to do the blood test. So more and more men are getting the blood test. So we're picking up more and more black men at a younger age group. And because of which, at that age group, men are still sexually potent. They worry a lot about their erections. They want to know that the treatment that they're getting is going to be not affecting the erection. That's why one of my patients went off to the US for the robotic surgery, because as far as he's concerned, he's married, he's 59, and he's still in love with his wife. She comes to every visit to the office with him. And incidentally, as I said, there were two of the patients I, we, I discussed. They, one of them, the one who had robotic surgery was in my office today. Okay, just to check his first PSA six weeks after the um the robotic surgery. And the other gentleman, the one at the other extreme, who presented late 20 years now alive after diagnosis, he came today also. So yes, the younger one is worried a lot about his reactions. Yes, absolutely. And I, I know that sometimes when we discuss guidelines for prostate cancer management, which which have change significantly over time. One mm -hmm. of the parameters was age at presentation. Mm -hmm. So if, and this had to do with life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So initially, if he was 70 years and older, there was a tendency to be less aggressive in the interventions than if you were younger than 70 years old. I, I think the, the whole um, paradigm has shifted quite a bit given that we have this um, cohort of people dealing with prostate cancer. Do you also believe, and, and I'm, I'm asking these questions um, because we have several other questions here um, from our, our listeners online, that, that the, the cost of treatment, the, the, the modalities of treatment may impact on men's ability to get a positive outcome once they've been diagnosed in terms of hormone therapy and cost of hormone therapy. And um, you mentioned Zytiga um, and radiation, which in most cases in some of our islands is unavailable locally. 
I, I know it's unavailable in St. Vincent, it's unavailable in St. Lucia, Dominica, and Grenada, uh, St. Kitts. Um, so, you know, that means men will have to travel overseas to have that intervention, for instance, if you don't want that surgery and if, if the, the treatment is radiation. So how, how has that impacted on um, the management of prostate cancer in your experience? Um, I I see I still see more of the older men, like men over seventy, who present with uh, prostate cancer. Uh, let's say it's locally advanced, meaning it's not curable by surgery, but so they need radiation if they want to be cured. It would be a bimodal treatment where we usually do hormone treatment first before radiation. We call that neoadjuvant, as you know hormone treatment, we give them medication to shrink the prostate to make it easier to radiate and then they can go overseas and get the radiation done. I see more of that uh, type of, um, those type of men who say, Doc, I don't have the money. Younger men, I've noticed a, a paradigm shift. The younger men are getting more health conscious. A lot of them now are getting health insurance. So if I pick up a young man in his 50s with prostate cancer, even the sixties, usually they can pay for the surgery if they are locally, um, they are localized, meaning it hasn't spread and they therefore can be cured with surgery. And uh, or they can afford to go overseas and get radiation done because they now have health insurance or they have been saving. I think men are getting more aware that even in very wealthy countries that they need to do or pay something to help themselves. The good thing about all of this, um, Owen, is the fact that men are going earlier. So we're picking up the cancers earlier. That gives them options. Let me give an example. If you're a 55 year old who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, caught early, PS is four and a half, and you are the, let's say the intermediate type, you are a three plus four, meaning you're not that aggressive. You're early intermediate. We can put you on a pill a day, keep things under control, not even a very aggressive pill that would knock out your erections. And you will have time to look at your options, save the money to get, for example, a radical prospect be done fairly affordably. You can even get it done in St. Vincent on the public uh, 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 program where you can go to the hospital, wait for a few months, so to speak, and get your surgery free. So it doesn't have to be prohibitive. In other islands, you might have to pay, but I'm not aware of any Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean island. I know my colleague in Grenada, and I have discussed the price that was about 10 years ago. And even then, it was still less than ten thousand EC dollars to get everything done, the surgery and everything sorted out. So, there's the the surgery might sound expensive in the EC, but compared to it being done in what we call the Greater Antilles, our um, cousins to the north in Jamaica and uh, in 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 maybe Puerto Rico, certainly not Cuba because it'd be free. Uh, or in the south places like uh, Trinidad, our prices in the Eastern Caribbean is significantly cheaper compared to those in the our greater uh, Anthony Cody uh, um, cousins in the north and the south. Even Barbados, it's significantly more expensive than it being um, done in St. Vincent. So yes, it can be um, uh, expensive, but it's certainly not compared to our colleagues outside of the Eastern Caribbean. Thank you. I, 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 would, I would like to um, um, ask this question on behalf of Dwight Mathias. I, I don't see if you see that in the chat. It says, Doctor, please comment on the rate of increased PSA levels despite the level of less than 4.5 being in the normal range. Should one be concerned if one year ago 0.9 has now become 2.5. Also comments on the age when screening should begin and if there is a um, family history of prostate cancer. Oh, that's a loaded question, Owen. Yes, you should be concerned. If you're a man at uh, 40 who did his PSF for the first time and it's 0.9, even that figure 0.9 at 40 years old is suspicious, okay? 
let's pass for, let's say he's 45 and the PSA year goes 0.9 and the one year later is 2.5. There are only two things that do that. Well, three things. One, artifact, in other words, there have been an error. Two, you picked up an infection. And many times, if your prostate's enlarged, let's just model so you can pick up infections. If you're not very discreet with your sexual um, contact, you can pick up an infection and you can have a slight urease PSA. And 0.9 to 2.5 is not slight, it's significant urease PSA from an infection. So a urinalysis and a rectal, ex digital, rectal examination can, can help to differentiate that. And the third reason is actually a slow growing latent prostate cancer. Prostate cancer just doesn't appear out of nowhere. You're not now at risk because the PSA is full. You were at risk before that because what this gentleman has is a positive velocity PSA. In other words, the PSA velocity is upward sloping, it's positive. It's going up and not just going up within the normal rate of 0.1 nanogram per mil per year. It's going up higher than that. It's gone up, well, let's say 1.5, in a year, 1.6, so that's significant. So he should be concerned. When, so his doctor should be able to, to see a urologist, he should be able to tell him, oh, you just had an infection, here's some antibiotics, repeat the PSA in six weeks time after the antibiotics are finished, and you'll notice that the, the PSA drops down to 0.9 or maybe even lower than 0.9. If that's the case, you should breathe easily. If it drops from 0.9 to 1.5, you shouldn't breathe easy. You should actually repeat in six months, especially if you have black point. Which turns to the next point, black men are more at risk. So unlike the US and, and most Caucasian countries where this is start at age 50, we tell them start at age 40. And if I had a, a family history that was strong and the father died at 60 and two or three of his siblings had it in their late 40s, I would say, look, start from mid-30s. Start doing your PSA because you have a strong family history and therefore at 35, 36, 37, okay? Uh, but for most black men, we advise you, irrespective of your family history, start at 40 because you have a genetic history that's based on your ethnicity, if not your family. And then uh, the other part of that question was the positive uh, velocity and the, the, the time for starting. Yeah, we do it every year for uh, yearly from 40. And if you have a strong family history, you need to monitor that PSA and how fast it goes up. We call it the PSA velocity. Most authorities would cut it off at two and a half before 50. So if you're a black man and you're less than 50 and your PSA is two and a half around there or between four and two and a half and four, with a strong family history, they would advise your biopsy, even if on the rectal examination, you cannot feel anything. So let me repeat, between 40 and 50, your PSA is around two and a half, hovering in that area. You have a strong family history. The rectal examination is, is, is negative. There's nothing there. I'd send it for an MRI. The MRI says there's something suspicious, I'd biopsy you. I, the MRI says, no, nah, there's nothing suspicious. I will still monitor you with a strong family history. Six months later, I do the PSA. If the PSA is still going up, you know, it's going to uh, three or 2.8, I'd monitor you again. If in the next six months it's going to 3.2, I say, no, nah, it's going up too fast. Even if the MRI is negative, you're now 48 years old, I strongly suggest him he gets a, a biopsy of his prostate. Plan. Thank you. I, I think, you know, the, the, the important message here is that know your risk factors, see your doctor, have those annual checkups done. And I'm so happy that in this tonight's presentation, I can see so many men. Usually, even when we have men's health talks, women appear. But uh, luckily tonight, we have many men present. I think it has been captivating. I, I see the faces of our men glued onto the screen and listening attentively to what has been said so far. I, I think a lot of important messages have been have come across that, you know, if, if you are seeing your doctor, your general practitioner, and there are doubtful concerns, uh, doubts and concerns about the prostate and the PSA, try to see your specialist because your specialist has more experience and knows 
how to manage that 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 prostate in a better way, whether it's, it's an infection, whether it's benign prostatic hyperplasia, or if it just needs monitoring for a low risk cancer, um, cancer of the prostate. So encouragement to to go to your medical profession, healthcare professionals to see about your prostate. And if there is any person on the platform now who wishes to pose a question to Dr. Deshaun, please, um, you're welcome to do so um, by a show of hands so that we we don't have, you know, too much of a calamity when if too many people want to ask questions. Well, can I make a comment? Um, I'm still disheartened with the, um, the, the, the heights of the PSAs I'm still seeing. I've been in this country for 22 years now. And uh, I still see men walking in my office with PSAs 30 and 40. I mean, this is not a finger test you're trying to avoid. This is a blood test we are asking you, just go and get it uh, done. I'm actually in the process, along with a couple of agencies, of trying to get our government to offer the PSA test free. Women can come to our clinics, go to the districts and get a pap smear free. You can go and get a blood test for your sugar and your A1C instant Vincent free. I think the time has come for our governments to offer simple screening tests like a PSA free. I think it's the best thing we can offer our men. It's unfortunate that I'm still seeing men in their 60s walking into my office. He's usually the sole or the main breadwinner for his family. Walking into the office with PSAs in the 30s and 40s. And if that sounds bad, I'm still seeing men in their 50s with PSAs in the teens, 12 and 13 and 14, whose prostate still um, it's enlarged and feels abnormal as though they have prostate cancer. And this is 22 years after coming to St. Vincent. That's to tell you how difficult it is to get men to take their health seriously. We're still not doing it. We're still, here's the, the, the problem. We're still waiting on a symptom. Yeah, men are still, Doc, I'm fine. I'm not having any pain. There is still that recalcitrant attitude of men, of feeling that I have to have pain first. I have to have some symptom. I'm pee, -pee and go doc. Pee, pee is fine. I'm not having pain before I go to see a doctor. This has to stop. A regular general check has to become part of every man's lifestyle. Most Caribbean countries will offer you free health checks at their district clinics, at the government facilities. There are very few Caribbean countries, even, you know, in the Eastern Caribbean, I'm sure St. Lucia has uh, poly clinics, district clinics, whatever you call them, government facilities, where a man can go and say, doc, can I get a full run through quickly? You know, he might have to pay nominal toward a blood test, but certainly the physical is free. You get pressure check, sugar check, and such things. Most GPs and family practitioners would do a PSA as part of the regular check. I've been doing it for 22 years and I'm still seeing men come into my office in their 50s and their 60s with PSAs in the teens and the 20s and the 30s. And it happens every week, both privately and publicly. I, I agree. And um, again, I think the overriding factor here sometimes, and the bottom line is about financial capacities sometimes. Because I say this because even when a man is being treated, it is time that our insurance agencies cover routine health screening. So because you have asymptomatic um, men and the insurance agency will not compensate, uh, reimburse you for a general health checkup, which, which is, is mad because in that way you are able to diagnose early enough, when not necessarily always with prostate cancer, and you are able to spend less money as an insurance agency in, in, in those patients that you have advanced stages of illness and you have to spend so much more money that they may need to travel overseas and get sophisticated interventions. So it's, I agree with you, Dr. Deshaun, that there's a need for a, a, a radical 
shift in our thinking, in our the way we perceive health care for our kind of region where there are low resources. And there's still a cultural lag in understanding that health is part of the, the development of a country, that the wellness of a country is equivalent to the productivity of a country. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a, a, a whole of society um, problem that not just governments, but you know, civil society need to start encouraging men to seek um, healthy lifestyles and uh, go to their doctors so that we can have a better um, outcome in in the in the the healthcare um, spectrum that we currently see. Is uh, Mr. Matthias, uh, were you satisfied with the response you got so far? Is there anybody else who would like to make a, a comment in this area? I think Dr. Deshaun has been quite explicit in in all of his all of what he said so far, and I mean, I hopefully, uh, if you wish, I'm sure you you're able to contact Dr. Deshaun. Um, in St. Vincent at uh, Deshaun and Deshaun. Um, um. Uh, oh, and excuse me, one of the, what someone just asked, why are black men more prone to having prostate cancer? And uh, simply, genetics. As a race, oh, yes, there you are. we are more prone genetically. It's an ethnic issue. Why there have been a few studies that links our testosterone levels as being higher than Caucasians, Ch Chinese, etc. That's why black men are great at sports. We have bigger muscles, we have bigger bones, we generally taller, and uh, and so on. We're generally more imposing. But there are a couple of other factors. I think testosterone is a link, but it, and genetics and testosterone go hand in hand. But I think it also has to do with our lifestyle you're more likely to see obese. And obesity is a risk factor. But unfortunately, lots of our black men let go of ourselves as you get older. I teach medical students and uh, here in St. Vincent, and a lot of them are from Nigeria. And ever so often, I get one of them telling me it's not uncommon. Like in every 10, one or two of them, doc, is a PSA 54 uh, 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 higher? So yes, it is. Who's that, your father? Yeah, my dad has PSA 54 and he's going to see his doctor and uh, about a biopsy and things like that. And I've had no less than half a dozen students in the last year who tells me that their father's PSA is in the 50s or 60s. So even back in Africa, we are seeing this. A few of them told me that their fathers have died from prostate cancer. The highest... PSAs they found in terms of men with, sorry, men with prostate cancer found was in Jamaica. That's because I suspect their cancer registry is better kept than us in the Eastern Caribbean. But I would dare to bet that the black men in Jamaica, the black men in, in, in Western Africa, the black men in the Eastern Caribbean have the same high rate, sometimes two to two and a half times that of Caucasian men in North America. So we are at risk because we are black. It's our genes, it's our testosterone, it's our lifestyle. It's a combination of factors, but the most important one is our ethnicity, which links us, our genes, our ethnicity. That's us, prostate cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Deshaun. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel we can continue the entire night to discuss this issue. And certainly persons who have more questions, I'm sure Dr. Deshaun can be contacted in St. Vincent. Um, you will see his... Um, his um his contact information um certainly if, if you would need you know further advice for relative and so on i i want people to i know many people have joined just as we have been um, presenting the program and i had said that tonight's uh session will include um two presentations one on, on uh, in addition to the prostate cancer which dr deshaun just did another one by professor um, Shamil Kowich on colorectal cancer. Um, so I, 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 I'd like to invite you um, for us to, to, to have a, a, a small, a short intervention of a, a cancer survive, survivor. Mr. Satish Bidesi is a survivor of testicular cancer and he is an advocate for cancer survivors and certainly um, persons who, who, uh, 
who uh, support cancer initiatives. I would like to thank profusely Dr. Deshaun for his presentation this evening. I, you know, I would encourage him to stay on if he so desires. I'm sure he has many things to do. And so, but Dr. Sean, thank you so much. Um, we will hope to have you again on another session. I, I think this has been um, people have left, left wanting more, wanted to hear from you so much more. But thank you for your your, your presentation this evening. Um, I'm so pleased that you were able to be with us. And if you if you do have to leave, I, 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 no, I'm, I'm you know, I, thanks for okay, thank stay you. on and listen to Dr. Uh, Professor Kawiti presentation okay all right then so yeah. we have a, a, a brief um, um intervention